Welcome to the My Focus Inspire Me podcast. Welcome listeners today. Um, first of all, my name is Leonie Lamb. I am a career coach, uh, speaker, and I have George Constantine here today with me. Welcome, George. How are you? I'm very well, Leonie. How are you? I'm good. I'm very excited to have you on this podcast, George. I am excited that you're excited. We're going to have some fun, I think. <laughs> yes, and we'll, we'll have a couple of laughs together and I'll try and minimise my laughs. Yeah, I will be trying to maximize your last, Leonie, so that's usually how this rolls with us. Okay, so dear listeners, we will be talking, um, learning more about George and on the topic of resilience and the psychological safety in the workplace. And so let's um, first of all talk about how I know, how I know George. Uh, so we worked together um, many years back in, at, a, at a training organization. George was the key a corporate trainer, facilitator at that point in time. Everyone, I've seen him in action, uh, his full of energy and love being in his workshops. So that's how I met George. Uh, we stayed in touch. And one, one moment, one of the moments that was quite memorable in my life was when I had coffee with him one day near Town Hall Station. Um, and I asked him, George, what is it about me that, you, you know, you like to hang out with me? What, what is it? And he actually said, Leonie, you're just real. You're, you're real. You're really, truly, you're, you know, authentic. And it was actually a moment in my career, in my life, where I thought, wow, like that's a really good, you know, feedback. So I see George as a mentor, as a friend. Um, and then during the pandemic, um, we stayed in touch and he read one of my news, newsletters and he said, hey, Leonie, why don't we collaborate together? Let's do something fun. And he said that he'll be happy to be a speaker at one of my events. And and then I invited him to join online, um, outstanding event. All the participants loved him. And after that, um, uh, this year, we, I had a moment in my business where I had a little bit of a problem um, in my business where I caught up with him for coffee. He gave me stacks of advice, um, suggestions, when you want to call it, but really just made me reframe my thinking. And it was another moment where I thought, wow, that is so good. And so we've been um, yeah, co collaborating, uh, friends, and help each other in business. Um, so here we are today. <laughs> um, so moving forward, I would now um, also mention in terms of his LinkedIn profile. So I've got his bio in front of me. I have his LinkedIn profile in front of me. George is a consultant. Uh, he's a facilitator, he's a leadership coach, and what I love about his, uh, what I can see in his LinkedIn profile, he says uh, he's a lifelong learner, and so that is awesome. Uh, he's, has got, he has more, over 20 years of, of experience uh, in, in, in industry experience, entrepreneurial and management experience as well. Um, so what I thoroughly enjoyed reading in um, the, his LinkedIn profile was that once you really see people, they will be open to seeing possibilities. So I love that sentence so much. So let's get and, started. And it, yeah, go on. And it, as it, and it resonates true. I mean, you talked about how you know me, but for me, you are what authenticity looks like and what it feels like. And that's what draws me to you. And that's what draws me to a very small handful of people that I consider friends and peers and colleagues. So thank you for having me today. And thanks for that intro that totally embellishes the things that I do, right? So... <laughs> <laughs> all right, just, you ready? Just, I, I am you ready. ready. All right, let's do this. Yeah. <laughs> George. So um, I guess it'd be good for our listeners to know a little bit more from your perspective, uh, your, your story about your career and your business journey. Okay, so in a nutshell, it, was, it definitely is a journey. So I studied law, went into recruitment, trained recruiters, then fell into training and fell in love with the that wonderful gift that you have when you can actually build other people's capability and have been in the training game, you know, developing people's skills and knowledge, just adding value wherever I can since then. So as you wrote, as you said before, it's about 20 years worth of coaching, facilitating and consultation experience. And it's just a joy what we do, Leonie, to be able to just actively listen to another human being and give them something that they can actually take away and be better, faster, stronger with. And in terms of your business? 
So the business I started only a handful of years ago, and it's just been, you know, a a business of one. Um, but I have since looked at how I'm going to scale that, and I've had the pleasure and the privilege of working with some very very good professionals who are out there, and um, just working on some exciting things for the months to come in terms of what we do. Um, but one of the things that you would know as well, and any entrepreneurial founder that's listening to this podcast is when you're on one person band um, you can only be in one place at the one time unfortunately while you're that one person band your mind is in many places at the same time so finding a way to sustainably scale your expertise is I think is I think the gold at the end of the rainbow mm -hmm. for us and that's what I've been working on for the last few months and I've been lucky enough to Get a lot of support around that in that space and exciting things to come. Mm. So the podcast topic is uh, title is resilience and psychological safety in the workplace. But for just for those listeners who have heard this term, you know, for the first time, what is psychological safety? The psychological safety, and one thing I want to say that's really important here is that it's there's a difference between being safe and feeling safe. And that's a big ticket item in the corporate world, right? So you can create the safest work environment there is known to man and policies and procedures are in place and all the compliant workplace strategies are there, but people may still not feel safe. So psychological safety is not just about being comfortable at work because that's not where progress happens. It's about being able to be uncomfortable and still feel safe, about being able to feel included, contribute, and also challenge without any fear of reprisal or blowback. And I think that's where psychological safety as a term and as best practice is grow is getting a lot of attention now because we need that more than ever. Mm. We, have, we have a real mixed bag of people out there and we need to be able to draw from the wonderful benefit of diversity of thought. And I think that's where psychological safety comes in. You're welcome. You can speak your mind, you can have a different opinion, and we will embrace that and see what we can do with it. Mm. That's, in essence, what psychological safety is about. Mm. Thank you. I, I can remember many times early in my career where you just don't feel safe to speak up. You're, like, you're just worried that maybe if you speak up and say something, you'll, feel you'll, you'll get into some kind of trouble or some kind of political, uh, yeah. yeah. And we have Thank massive... You massive organizational hierarchies, global conglomerates, large public sector organizations that have that Machiavellian nonsense that plays out, you know, at the reporting lines and, and across structural levels. And I think the more of that we can break down, the better it is. Because ultimately, nobody's going to work thinking to themselves, how can I make someone else feel bad about themselves? But it's happening. Mm. It's happening. And if we all treat each other like the people that we are, because we're all from the same planet. Um, you sure? <laughs> my, my, I'm still waiting for my tests to come back, but yeah, as far as I know, by all accounts, I am of this planet, yes. <laughs> but I think that's what it is. It's diversity of thought. It's not pointing out each other's differences. It's pointing out the fact that it's a beautiful thing that we're all different and we can find lots, lots of divergent ways of getting to convergence, yeah? Mm. So I'm really curious about a setback in your career or business that had had influenced you to become who you are today, George. So there's, see, again, with me, it's about how you define a setback, right? So for me, I was, and I keep the story very short, but I was running a business out of state and from a business point of view, I guess, or from a professional point of view, would see it as a setback that you'd say, I can't work away from home anymore. Um, but that was a conscious decision that I made. And what could be seen as a setback in a professional sense was an absolute blessing in a personal sense. And then when you feel empowered personally, when you're amongst family and friends, when you're contributing in social ways rather than just financial ways, it just, it just does wonders for the soul, right? And then you get more stuff done. 
so that was one setback it was just it was the the tyranny of distance mm. and and the decision one has to make sometimes in terms of the career versus the other parts of your life that need attendance so during that time what were some of the one or two things that in terms of lessons learned for you it was how easily you can get caught up in the noise and the work and the hubris for success and progress for the sake of progress and justify your lack of presence in other aspects of your life because of it mm. Like it's like in some sales organizations where the rock star salesperson gets all the kudos but could possibly be the biggest turd in the place, right? But because mm. they're getting the results, we're constantly patting them on the back. So we're mm. reinforcing behaviors that may not be very good for everybody else, but yeah, they look great on the bottom line. Mm. So it's so easy to buy into that, Leone. Mm. Yeah. So in, in reference to, I guess, uh, the... the title of this podcast can you walk us through uh, a training program that you deliver and possibly a client where you've delivered at this and the results you've you've made yeah so the one thing and as i said to you before the biggest challenge i'm currently facing is the scalability of what i do right but mm. one of the big ticket items in terms of the program one of the kinds of programs that i do is the fact that every kind of program that i do is different by virtue of the context that i do it in and the people within that context. So step one in any kind of program that's, you know, that's designed to empower people and enable the people that work with those people is, is, is sorting yourself out. It's that leading self piece. It's self-awareness, self-regulation, and then the social awareness that comes with that. But if you're too caught up in your own head and you don't understand the impact and the consequences of your own behavior, you're no good to anybody. Mm. So every program begins with self. It goes back to that little tagline that you read out before about me in terms of, you know, when you see people. And that doesn't just apply to the audience that's outside of you. There is another audience that we need to be mindful of, and that is ourselves. What mm -hmm. do you see in yourself? What looks back at you at the mirror every morning? What do you, how do you walk your talk? How do you convey messages? How do you communicate? All of those things play out to the most important the most important audience there is, and that is yourself, right? Mm. So every program begins there, Leonie. Yes. Just to comment on that. So mm -hmm. essentially it's around helping people understand, uh, start, starting with the self, but really it, it, what just stood out for me just now is that if you have a good relationship with yourself, then when you go to work and contribute in team meetings and organizations, it's going to, your performance will be hopefully stronger, better, happier. But if you have a bad relationship with yourself, then that's going to play out in really negative ways. Absolutely. And for, so your training in, involves helping people identify coming home to themselves and looking at themselves first before going out there into the world. Yeah, absolutely. And it sounds like a profoundly simple thing to do, but it's also one of the most difficult tasks one has to face. Simple yes. process, yes, but difficult to actually do. There's so many biases, there's so many, there's so many subconscious cues, there's so, so much blame association in your brain, there's so many things going on that make it very hard for you to just stop, breathe and say, okay, who am I, what do I want and how am I going to get it? And how does that add value to everyone else that I care about and everyone else who is touched by what I do. It's actually hard work to yeah. go back to basics and because we, we get so busy and we focus on other people yeah. uh, that really like I find that people don't have either capacity or time or awareness to connect with themselves. So doing this work, being part of your workshops would be quite, so it can be a wake up call for a lot of people. It is. That's the whole point. <laughs> And it's about just providing the tools and the techniques to allow people to do it for themselves, yeah? Yes. Because And pardon the, pardon the language, but nobody likes a smart ass, right? So you don't walk up to someone and say, what you need to do is, this mm. is about enabling somebody else to just do all the things that you just said. Take mm. a look at themselves, introspect, and really think about and reflect on what they've learned from their experiences and project what they need to look like moving forward. And just be in the present. Because mm. that's all you've got. Mm. Present. 
So tell me, um, if you can share with that, the listeners, is, hey, is there a client, uh, of, of course, not giving any names, but an example where you help an individual or organisation? So a recent example is I've uh, got engagement results from a team across a division in a public sector organisation where engagement's gone up um, two digits by about 20%. And that's by virtue of the fact that there's a lot more communication, there's a lot less guarded um, kind of nonsense going on. And mm. everyone has just been afforded the opportunity to just speak up. And it's come mm. from the top, which is an absolute joy because you need that. You need that advocacy from leadership. So kudos yes. to the leadership team that I'm referencing. Um, but, yeah, uh, customer service outcomes have improved by 22%. Engagement's gone up 19% in, mm. in, in a calendar year in, mm. in an environment that was deemed a difficult group of people, which I hate that because I hate labeling people, but that's how it was presented to me as a, as a sort of, as an assignment. And mm. they're, just, they're just wonderful people who just want to get on with work, but there was just a lot of noise and a lot of old school habitual mm. stuff that was just floating around. Mm. So it, that's, that's, that's been brilliant. That's been so much fun. And how have you got any like any of the participants? Anyone actually say anything about the program that really can be a statement around how they felt after attending your workshop or coaching? That's the the, the thing. The thing about it is that it's just it's a narrative, right? There's no there's no real taglines in that. It's such as you said, it's hard work, but it's also a longitudinal thing. It's not just a moment in time where someone just mm. looks at you and says, "George, you've changed the way I." work um, yeah. but I, ha I do know for a fact that I've had conversations around the fact that relationships have been transformed outside of work mm. um, the, the noise has stopped that disconnect between who I am and what I'm expected to do when I put on the gear or put on the suit um, goes away because we are the same person whether we're at work or at home or playing up with our friends it's it's just the case that behavior is contextual yeah it's the situation we're in we adapt our behaviors Mm. And it comes down to just separating who you are with the choices you make around behavior. But if you label yourself with your behavior, it's very hard to break away from that. So it goes back to a full circle to the original mm. question. Yeah, Who are you? What do you want? And how do you walk your talk? Who are you? What do you want? And how you walk your talk? Mm. And I think what I noticed in the way you deliver workshops is you bring people on this journey. And... I don't think you can lie to George. It's like, if you lie, I know you're lying <laughs> and I'm going to get you. Um, so I think when you present what I've noticed over the years, you just captivate the audience and, and people show up. Uh, if they don't show up as who they are, you make them show up. <laughs> yeah. But I think that's, that's the secret sauce, Leanne. If you show up in any kind of work as yourself, People gravitate to you because mm. everyone's so caught up in whatever narrative they have, they feel they have to give in that moment, in that setting, in that context, in that place with those people. If you mm. can step back from that and just be you, mm. it just cuts through so much noise. Yes. And the social aspect of that, as you rightly point out, isn't any magic thing. It's just people look at you and go, this guy's being for real. Like that's who he is. Mm. And you can't fake enthusiasm, right? You might get away with it for a moment, but mm. you can't. You can't fake that. So when you're genuinely enthusiastic about being in a place and you see the opportunity that every moment brings, you've got the room. Yes. So that mm. doesn't happen by design. That just happens intuitively. It happens by default for me. That's There's mm. no airs and graces. And it's cost me things in my career. It's cost me engagement. <laughs> it's cost me employment. Mm. Right? But, but here's the thing. I can sleep at night, right? Mm. I can look people in the eye and give them my honest opinion. And that, for me, is worth a lot more than, you know, being in some highfalutin meeting now with a, the with a cigars and cognac lads. You know, it's just not me. It just mm. doesn't. And if I get to that stage, I would have done it as myself. Mm-hmm. So there's kind of an answer. Yeah, no, thank you. No, it was really good to to really di deep dive into what you do and how you how 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 things happen. And um, moving along, um, 
Oh yeah, the, the next question I have here is that we are at the end of this year. Uh, oh. So what do you think will be a key driver for workplaces in the up upcoming months? I think it's I think it's why we chose this topic. For me, it is really just just put, parking the noise for a sec. I mean, we talk about diversity and inclusivity. We talk about so many disparate things and so many prescriptive things that we just need to just be a little bit more organic and go, yep, we're a real mixed bag of licorice all sorts. You're who you are. I am who I am. Let's focus on the work. Let's focus on the contribution each one of us can make. And stop worrying about what everyone else thinks and feels because if we take personal accountability as adults as adults yeah so this is a tough love message Leonie. so as an adult if you own your behavior and mm. you're a leader or a role model in your organization i am much more inclined if i work for you or work with you to return the favor and own my behavior right but if we perpetuate this nonsense where we're building credibility by discrediting other people, whether it's the competition, whether it's peers or colleagues or people in that department over there, mm. then it's not going to serve us well. It's just not going to serve us well. So I think that's big. The organizations next year that will really just embrace the fact that we are a whole bunch of people and we're here to get some work done and focus on the work mm. and their productive capacity that's sustainable and rewarding and fulfilling, they're going to smash it. Mm. Everyone else would be too, too worried about offending each other. Mm. So essentially, it's that psychological safety. Just continue to create the safe space where yeah. people can speak up, people can speak the truth. Absolutely. Yes. Without, without any fear of reprisal or persecution or anything like that. But if mm. we keep talking about persecution and reprisal, that's what we see. Mm. That's, that's the amazing thing about our brains. We, we gravitate towards what we keep reinforcing, yeah? So let's mm. reinforce the fact that, yes, we're all different and we're not going to get around that. Mm. And my big ticket item, and I probably shouldn't give this away, but I'm going to, is that respect is a noun and a verb. Mm. Okay? Yes. I can show you respect as a professional, Leonie, but I may or may not respect you. And I'm entitled to that opinion, yeah? Mm. I, I, sh I should never act on that because that's judgment and that's my own and I can keep it. But how I respond to you is as a professional. It's when mm. you externalize the nonsense in your head that things get noisy and yucky for people. Mm. Right? So showing respect and having respect are two different things. And I think that's where we've blurred it. I think that's where there's so much confusion out there in the workplace. Mm. You don't necessarily have to respect everybody because that is a very, very altruistic notion. But you need to show everybody respect. Totally. Because that because that's a reflection of you, not of anybody else. 100%, yes. And I think that's the big ticket item as we move forward as this, whatever this is that we're living through. Mm. So the, the two more questions to go, and these Tell two me. questions I ask all other guests on this podcast. Uh, what is a book that you would like to give away? If you were to gift someone, give a book to someone as a gift, what... What would be the name of that book? So that's an interesting one because this one's a classic. And as soon as you said book, I thought about it because I reread it only a few weeks ago. And that's The Alchemist. Like, mm. just it's just a joy. It's, there's no pretension in it. It's just a story, and you just take from it what you will. And you can read it different times in different stages of your life and take what you need from it. And that's a joy. Oh, thank you. I actually have that copy of that book, and I'm going to possibly reread it <laughs> it's 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 a great book it's, it's and it's a quick read too mm, just for the listeners can you repeat the name of that book again and the it's author the, the alchemist mm. been around for 25 odd years yes and it's yes. coelho paolo mm. coelho yes with a thank, C. thank That's you brilliant brilliant narrative and you know you're full of energy you're always full of energy and, and i haven't sat this still for this long for a long time <laughs> so i'm doing this for you leonie lamb <laughs> i know i was thinking oh my god he hasn't moved yet I, i'm kicking my little legs throughout like a whole course of this interview my friend <laughs> so what do you do on a daily basis that you have this positivity and uh, you know enthusiasm everywhere you go what, what's your secret to 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 be that there you isn't one. yeah there isn't one and and i think I think it's just waking up and just being grateful for what you have, whether it's anywhere near what other people think you should have. 
just be grateful because that's really the the foundational emotional trait that underlies everything it gives you something to build on so can you give him an exact give us an example of I'm like waking up for, and grateful for I'm, what i'm grateful yes. for the fact that i woke up in a comfortable bed next to my beautiful wife i'm grateful that i have three ridiculously brilliant young people that i call my children i'm grateful that i have friends near and far that i can draw from whenever i need to i'm grateful i'm mm. grateful that every day above ground i can make a contribution mm. i'm grateful that i'm educated enough to to learn from each day even when i don't succeed in the traditional sense of the word mm. And have you always been uh, practicing the gratitude for like all your life, or is it something you've adopted over the years? I don't think deliberately the only, but as you learn, you sort of you look back on stuff that's worked for you and go on, oh yeah, I do that. Mm. Right. And anybody listening to this podcast will have those moments, right? You'll read something really cool and go, oh, I did that once and that worked for me. So it's just the case of catching those moments where things work for you and just repeat, repeat, repeat. I would like to add my comment to the gratitude practice because I've been practicing um, and doing a gratitude practice since 2007 when I started with a gratitude journal mm -hmm. and um, starting from a journal, writing about three to five things that I'm grateful for. And so today I will be, after so many years of practice, I will identify moments in my day that I'm grateful for, uh, the coffee that I had this morning, I'm grateful for um, my health, I'm grateful for uh, you, George, being here, I'm grateful for, um, you know, all the simple things, or something, sometimes I'm grateful for things that uh, hasn't happened. <laughs> but so, I'm going to give you, yeah. I'm going to give you a modern day caveat with gratitude, yeah? Mm. And you may not like it because you're intelligent enough to use gratitude productively, but gratitude should not lead into complacency mm. so you can be grateful yes. but you still need to build on that absolutely so i'm mm. not talking about the kind of gratitude that says i have everything i need and i'm done because mm. every day you should take steps forward every day you should look towards success in any way you want to define it but gratitude for me is the fact is that foundation stone mm. that allows you to build on it in a healthy way yes and you know what's also really good when you're upset at some, when you're actually upset at someone, <laughs> like um, you know, could, like one of my friends actually said, oh, "I'm upset at my husband. I'm really angry at him." And then I start to think about the gratitude, you know, do a quick gratitude practice of what three things I'm grateful for in him, and suddenly my anger just slowly <laughs> goes down. <laughs> I have no idea how that works, right? That's that's I don't that's some kind of witchcraft stuff there, right? I, <laughs> Is that possible? <laughs> is that even possible? I, I just, my last question to you, George, is, is there anything else you'd like to add to this podcast? <laughs> I just, just, this is fun. And I, and I must say to anyone watching this, this was literally my first ever podcast. So you were gentle and it went really well. So it was an absolute joy. And I couldn't have, couldn't have imagined a, a better forum to, to do it in and a, and, a, and a better sort of co-conspirator to do it with. Yeah. So this was, this was fun unexpectedly a lot more fun than I thought it would be. I was I, going to enjoy the process, but I've had a ball. Well, that's awesome, considering you've been sitting still for a long, long time. Uh, just what's happening below is, is, is there's a lot going on, mate. <laughs> well, so thank you. Is... Thank you very much, George. And thank you for Pleasure. everyone who's listening. I will be um, inviting a few more speakers coming on to this podcast channel in the next few months. So stay tuned. Uh, and uh, if you haven't subscribed to this channel, please subscribe, whether it's on YouTube or, or Spotify, and uh, we'll, be, we'll stay in touch. Thank you so much, George. Pleasure. Thank you, Leanne. It was fun.